my name is Matthew Weaver. I'm a barrister at Radcliffe Chambers. Um, some of you online will know me, others will not. Um, I uh, specialise in insolvency, company and commercial matters. Um, and I was until recently on the Attorney General's A panel for Directors Disqualification and Matters um, and was removed from that panel when I took silk um, a couple of weeks ago. This is welcome all. This is a, um, a webinar on directors duties post COVID. Um, it'll touch on a number of different issues. Some of them are directly COVID related. Some of them have simply occurred during the pandemic period. And some of them look forward to issues that might arise post COVID and in the next few months and years as to what issues may arise in terms of directors duties and claims against directors generally. Um, hopefully uh, this will be a helpful webinar for everyone involved in directors cases so those that uh, act for and advise directors but also those that act for and advise office holders or creditors in terms of claims they might want to make against um, directors so as i say this is um, titled directors duties post covid19 um, it's uh, partly to do with covid it's partly to do with um, simply what's happened in that interim period um, what I want to look at is developments during the period of the pandemic um, and what the post-COVID future might look like in terms of director's duties and certain issues that I've identified that might become um, relevant and or interesting as we go forward. So it's a combination of some noteworthy cases that have uh, been heard in the last couple of years or so, the impact of legislation changes uh, around COVID and then possible issues going forward. So the first case um, I just want to discuss very briefly and put on your um, put on your uh, targets if you haven't already read it is Systems Building Services Group Limited back in 2020. Uh, and this is um, a case that evolved from a claim against a director who was the sole director and shareholder of the company. The company went into administration in July 2012. It then subsequently went into creditors voluntary liquidation uh, with the same office holder remaining as liquidator. Um, in 2014, whilst the company was in liquidation, the director purchased the company's most substantial property from the liquidator and the uh, current replacement liquidators uh, allege that that was a transaction at an undervalue, i.e. he bought it for significantly less than the proper value, um, albeit he had bought it from the liquidator at the time. In addition to that, um, in 2012, so just after the company went into administration, the director had um, caused the company to make three relatively small payments in the thousands rather than the tens of thousands to a creditor of the company after administration. And of course, the current liquidators challenge those payments as being a breach of the company's duty on the basis that they obviously put that creditor in a preferential position. Uh, so. The key question that this um, case, I think, is very helpful with is to what extent do directors continue to owe duties to act in the best interests of the company after it's gone into a form of insolvency, whether that's administration or liquidation? Um, and the director's case was very much that whilst he accepted that he couldn't escape all duties after the company went into administration or liquidation, he was um, very much of the view that his duties were severely restricted by the administration or liquidation to the extent that the only duties he owed were if he positively exercised powers qua director and in those circumstances yes he had to abide by his duties but in all other instances his duties fell away compared to the position pre-insolvency. Um, that was um, his position at trial, uh, it's fair to say that wasn't his position in his pleaded case and this issue of the extent to which duties were owed by a director post admin and liquidation was very much an idea thought up very close to trial uh, and to some extent the judge indicated in her judgment that that was obviously an issue and that parties ought to take steps to ensure that all the relevant issues are well and truly flagged up prior to trial but in any event she addressed it and um, she identified the following features, which is that, as we know, Schedule B1 for administrations and the Insolvency Act for liquidations don't provide that directors cease to be directors upon administration or voluntary liquidation. And um, what they provide 
is that a director is prevented from exercising any management power upon an administration, or indeed that the director ceases to have uh, the powers previously afforded to him upon the liquidation occurring, but he doesn't leave office and his appointment is not automatically terminated. In those circumstances, therefore, whilst the director maintained that his duties were limited after administration or liquidation to match with the fact that his powers were necessarily limited, the court said that that simply wasn't the case. Um, the court analysed sections 170 to 177 of the Companies Act 2006, where the common law duties have been codified within the statute, and observed that they are very much general duties of a director, and that they extend beyond merely the exercising of powers as a director, and therefore simply being a director, notwithstanding that one's powers have been removed and um, the ability to take actions have been curtailed by administration or liquidation, um, simply being a director triggers those duties. Indeed, if you look at section 172, that specifically extends duties to after a director has ceased to be a director, and therefore there was no um, obvious um, leap to suggest that the powers, uh, the duties, sorry, imposed on a director remained after liquidation or administration. Um, the Companies Act, as the court identified in certain instances, and section 193 is a, an example, does provide expressly where certain provisions of the Act are not to apply post liquidation, but there's no such provision that refers to section 170 or 177, and therefore the court couldn't see any obvious reason why those powers ought to be diluted. Indeed, um, it made the point, as I've already indicated, and as all of us that um, practice in this area know, that sections 170 to 177 is, is a codification of the previous common law position. And so given that those provisions are based on common law duties, um, whether they exist post administration and liquidation has to be viewed in that um, uh, atmosphere and that environment, which is that these are common law duties and there's no reason why those ought not to remain, notwithstanding that the company's gone into administration or liquidation. In short, whilst the court identified that there were, of course, further duties imposed on a director by the Insolvency Act, duties to cooperate, provide information and the like, in no way did that extinguish the fundamental duties under the Companies Act 2006. Um, it's um, perhaps surprising that we've got to 2020 before there was any great case law or commentary on duties of directors post liquidation, but certainly the judge in this case didn't consider that that was a problem for the court and that um, her analysis was quite clear that there's nothing in that that leads to the conclusion that the duties cease upon liquidation. And it does seem to me that that's um, a helpful um, tool for administrators, liquidators, less helpful for directors, who need to be fully aware that even once control of the company passes to an office holder and their powers are severely limited, um, that does not mean that they have free reign to act in whichever way they um, consider appropriate. And that includes, as was in this case, where they are the potential purchaser of companies' assets. So one can well see that this may well be an issue for directors in terms of prepacks or simply sales after a, a trading administration. Um, and directors will therefore need to be fully aware that whilst it's in their personal interest to acquire assets of the company at a discount and for as low as possible, perfectly understandable in the commercial context, they do still owe a duty to the creditors of the company via their duty to act in the best interests. And that's something they will have to bear in mind when uh, taking advice or entering into transactions, even though those transactions are with the office holder. So I think a helpful um, explanation and confirmation that um, that's the position of directors post insolvency. The next claim is um, entirely different in nature, uh, and it was a claim uh, brought uh, by way of a Section 212 misfeasance and a 213 fraudulent trading claim, and it's um, JD Group Limited from this year. Um, a claim against a director in respect of um, his company's part in an MTIC fraud. Um, and the reason I've highlighted this is because it's one of very few cases that deal with MTIC fraud in the context of fraudulent trading claims, 
or misfeasance claims against the director of a company that was simply part of the chain, which is all that was here. Um, this director was not one of the directors of the defaulter companies as they're described in MTIC fraud. He was simply part of the chain um, in allowing the purchase and sale of assets um, for a fraudulent purpose. Worth also bearing in mind when we get into it that claims for fraudulent trading are themselves extremely rare um, for good reasons in terms of the test and the relief that's available and whether it's in the advantage of creditors to bring those sorts of claims. But it's a useful reminder as to what the court will need to look at and therefore what an office holder will need to establish if it is going to run a fraudulent trading claim. Um, and it may be, and we'll touch on this a bit later in the webinar, that um, going forward, coming out of COVID, where you've had furlough claims, C bills and B bills, there is, it seems to me, the potential for claims for fraudulent trade to arise out of a company's activities during the COVID period and, and in respect of seeking to claim um, government benefits and government loans. But going back to this claim, uh, this was a claim concerning the purchase and sale of mobile phones um, in a, about a 12 month period between late 2005 and 2006. Um, the purchaser company of which our director was the director purchased mobile phones from two UK suppliers and then sold them to three overseas purchasers. So a pretty typical diagram of an MTIC fraud. Uh, the company paid VAT of about 2.1 million pounds to its suppliers, uh, which it then looked to offset against its own VAT liabilities. On investigation, HMRC considered the credits and uh, disallowed them on the basis that they said that the company either knew or had the means of knowing that the transactions to which those credits related, i.e. the purchase and sale of mobile phones, amounted to an MTIC fraud. Um, there was, as a result of that, a loss to HMRC um, and HMRC's claim in the liquidation of this company uh, was just over £1.5 million. Um, it's uh, starting wise, as I set out here, the case is a useful reminder of the tests that are applied in fraudulent trading. Um, there is, as we know, a twofold test for dishonesty, subjective and objective. Uh, and it's only if both are met um, that um, a fraudulent trading claim will be successful. Having said that, um, in terms of the subjective uh, knowledge of dishonesty, um, blind eye knowledge, as we've all come to know it, um, is perfectly adequate. So a director that simply turns away and refuses to accept the reality is not going to be able to escape liability. But ultimately, the question for whichever tribunal hears these sorts of claims is to determine the defendant's actual state of knowledge and whether their conduct was honest or dishonest, applying the objective standards of ordinary, decent people. Um, that um, is the test. It has been the test for some time. But given the rarities of these claims, I think this is a helpful claim to have in, in your back pocket or in your top drawer of your desk, should a fraudulent claim come across it, so that you can uh, easily look at what the tests are and what will have to be established if the claim is going to go forward. Um, Essentially, as I put in the bottom bullet point there, to be guilty of fraudulent trading, the director must be shown to have known of the fraud, albeit he doesn't have to have been aware of every detail or the precise mechanics. But untargeted speculative suspicion, as the court described it, will not be sufficient. So it's more than this smells bad, um, which is the test that um, certainly, in my experience, a number of practitioners have looked to apply in determining whether there's a case for fraudulent trading. It goes beyond that, but it doesn't require full knowledge of every single detail on the part of the um, director involved. The um, recent case law um, on dishonesty, so NatWest and Bilter from the Court of Appeal from 2021, um, obviously supports the principle that a party down the chain may be liable for dishonest assistance and fraudulent trading when the making of payments passed down the chain to facilitate the non-payment of VAT by the defaulter. So in a sense, if you're um, pursuing a director or acting for a director who's part of the chain, the question is going to be whether um, they were aware or should have been aware that their involvement and the payments they were making would be passed down the chain to facilitate a, a third party to carry out an MTIC fraud by non-payment of VAT. 
Um, in this case, um, obviously all cases are going to be factually distinguishable, but in this case, um, some of the really crucial factors that led the judge here to conclude that this director was aware um, of the MTIC fraud being carried out and of which his company was a party, were that um, whilst there was evidence of due diligence checks being carried out by companies, so um, the normal pro forma sheets with all the boxes ticked as one might expect, the difficulty that the director faced when he was cross-examined on this and provided his own evidence in chief was that um, firstly, it was quite clear that his company had started trading with the alleged fraudsters some time before he'd carried out due diligence. And so the mere fact that he had carried out the due diligence, the judge found that that was not um, done with the purpose of establishing whether he should trade with these people because he'd already started to do so. And so it was very much considered, as the judge put it, a tick, a tick box exercise where this director had set up a process by which it could give the appearance that he was carrying out the necessary due diligence without actually doing so. Forgive me. And this director um, made it very clear in his evidence uh, that he wasn't entirely up on all the details of his due diligence. He didn't carry it out himself. He got employees to do so. Uh, and indeed, um, the more that the Liquidators Council scraped away in cross-examination as to what role this director actually took, the more it became apparent that he was allowing these transactions to go ahead with no proper purpose. One example of that was that nobody could find any evidence of any negotiation of price for the um, thousands and thousands of mobile phones he was buying and selling. And that, the judge found, suggested that this was not a legitimate transaction, but was one that was part of a fraud. And therefore, on those uh, facts, this director was guilty of fraudulent trading and was guilty of breaching his duty um, uh, pursuant to the 212 claim and ordered to um, make uh, compensation to the company to reflect the losses to HMRC. So, as I say, a helpful case, um, not because the facts of every case will be the same, and they obviously won't, but just reminding all those involved of the test to be applied for fraudulent trading, which remains a, fel a fairly rare uh, claim to be advanced by liquidators. The third case I just want to um, bring up is Manalay Partners and NAG. Again, the facts of it aren't particularly earth changing. This was a claim against directors for misapplying the proceeds of sale um, and against the director's wife for dishonest assistance and knowing receipt. Um, in short, the director sold uh, the business in 2013. The, proce the proceeds of sale of that business, which had been successful up until that point, the proceeds of sale of that business were, instead of uh, being paid to the um, vendor entity, were uh, paid to a different bank account on the instructions of the director. And then the majority of it was paid out to third parties. And those parties ranged from other companies with which this director had a connection, but also included this director's mother and father-in-law. Um, and in those circumstances, um, therefore, it was said that he breached his duty by misapplying the proceeds of sale. Um, it was um, a key bit of evidence that um, when solicitors acting on the purchase and sale had asked for instructions as to the bank account for the vendor's um, receipt of uh, completion monies, the director and his wife both confirmed independently and together the details of the bank account to which those monies should be paid. And they were not the bank account of the selling company. They were, in fact, the bank account of a different company, which had nothing obviously to do with this sale other than being a company that was also linked with this director and his wife. Um, and that was um, said by the judge to be pretty indicative of what was going on. Um, the claim against the husband was fairly straightforward, as you would imagine. It's the claim against the wife that uh, seems to me to be interesting because it's a classic case here of the wife's argument being that she was not um, involved in the business. She was a, a housewife who was bringing up the family. She wasn't spending any attention on how the business worked or indeed the intricacies of this sale. So her point of view, which is one that we've seen from time to time over the years on these sorts of cases, is that she trusted her husband implicitly. He asked her to sign documents. She therefore didn't consider that she needed to read them or understand them. And she simply trusted her husband when he said, these are proper documents for you to sign to affect this sale. Um, 
so where does that then take us in terms of um, whether that amounts to dishonest assistance and knowing receipt? Well, here the dishonest assistance requires the fundamental elements that are set out at the bottom of the slide there. Dishonest assistance requires a trust. Well, that's um, easy when one's got company's assets, they are subject to a trust. A breach of trust by the director. Well, we had that here in terms of the paying away of the proceeds of sale. You then have to show assistance by the party accused of dishonest assistance. And here, that wasn't a problem because on the facts, it required the wife's signature to complete the sale as she was also a co-director, albeit a sleeping one, as it were. Um, and the, then the test is whether the spouse in this instance was not acting as an honest person would. And that again, um, introduces the two-stage test for dishonesty that we saw previously, so both subjective and objective. Um, what the court said, interestingly, and I do think this will be something helpful for office holders faced with this sort of scenario, um, where a spouse simply says they relied entirely on what the husband said, is the court said, look, in spouse cases, there's nothing wrong inherently with a spouse having a high level of trust in their husband or wife. But that is to be um, distinguished between situations like this one, where that high level of trust wasn't simply the reason that the wife entered into these transactions. It was that she simply did whatever she was told, regardless of whether it was right or wrong. And so in these sorts of cases, it seems to me unlikely that husbands or wives of directors are going to be able to get away with simply saying, I trusted him, therefore I took for her, and therefore I took no attention of what was going on and I didn't do my own checks. The court have made it clear here that doing what you're told, regardless of whether it is right or wrong, will amount to dishonest assistance. Um, knowing receipt was um, slightly more straightforward, but again, a good reminder of what's required. You have to establish disposal of the company's profit, uh, property, sorry. Uh, it has to be received by the defendant, either legally or beneficially, and knowledge by the recipient that the property belonged to the company. Um, and as to the knowledge of belonging to the company, the question is whether a reasonable person would have appreciated the transfer was probably in breach of trust, or would have made inquiries or sought advice, which would have revealed the probability of the breach of trust. So here again, you've got a useful a piece of armory for office holders, less so for um, recipient parties in these sorts of circumstances, where um, the simple defense of saying, I did not know as a matter of fact that this was a breach of trust is not going to be enough if the court is persuaded that a reasonable person would have appreciated that the transfer was probably in breach of trust, or at the very least would have made inquiries or sought advice. If you can establish that, and you can establish that those inquiries weren't made, it seems to me that ought to defeat that sort of defence. Um, just one final point on this case, which I thought was interesting, was that part of the husband's argument, part of the director's argument, which um, certainly I've seen rehearsed over the years in various forms, was we had solicitors involved on the sale, and they did not advise me that what I was doing was wrong. And therefore, on that basis, I'm entitled to raise and rely on the professional advice defense that directors routinely routinely rely on. Um, the court rejected that for a number of reasons, but one of them, which I think is helpful, is um, the identification, which might seem obvious to most of us, but something that um, I think is worth reiterating in any claim that might be met with this sort of defense, is that you cannot rely on the professional advice defense simply because solicitors are acting on a transaction in circumstances where you didn't ask for the advice in question and you certainly didn't receive it. And that was exactly the position here, which is not uncommon. Nobody asked these solicitors to advise on this transaction in terms of the questions that were raised here. They didn't provide that advice. Simply saying nothing about the transaction on the part of the solicitors was, was nowhere near enough to get the director into the realms of the professional advice defence. Two final recent cases, which I won't spend very much time on in terms of facts and um, the decisions, but again, helpful decisions in the last year or so about de facto directors. So a reminder uh, on the test for de facto directors, um, 
the first com the first case is Rekeeping Kids Company, which was a, a company director's disqualification case. Um, there, the court emphasised that there was no single test for whether somebody was a de facto director. The starting point is the corporate governance of the company, and the court's role is to identify functions that were the sole responsibility of a director and to identify who carried out or discharged those functions. So again, um, whilst we may all be familiar with the concept of de facto directors, I'm sure we are, when one is coming to specifically plead claims or to evidence the existence of a de facto director, it's important to have regard to that's the question the company will ask. Look at the corporate governance, identify functions that were the sole responsibility of a director, and then look at who carried out or discharged those functions. Um, if there are multiple directors, a de facto director has to be considered to be on an equal footing with the de jure directors, not simply a consultant or advisor or exercising influence in a different capacity. So um, we're all familiar with the idea that a shareholder can exercise um, influence over a company in that capacity without being a de facto director, as can an advisor or a consultant. Um, what was also helpful um, and identified in, in that case was that um, it is being involved in the decision-making process that is um, key. Even if an individual is consulted on what are otherwise um, board decisions that can only be made by directors, unless they are part of the decision-making process, so not simply asked for their view or consulted on something, but they have to be positively part of the decision-making process, only if they are will they be considered to be a de facto director. So offering advice, however persistent and however helpful and however strong to directors will not of itself um, identify a de facto director. Um, the courts um, in both of these cases, Keeping Kids and Umbrella Care, identified that the applicable points um, made by Lady Justin Arden and Smithton and Nager um, at those paragraphs remain informative. Um, I'm not going to take everybody through them, but um, you'll be familiar with them. Um, the fact that um, the court will have to determine the capacity the director was acting in, have to determine the corporate governance, look at what the director actually did. Um, it is not a defence for a defendant to say that they, they acted in good faith on the assumption that they were not acting as a director. The question is not um, that he acted um, knowing to be a director, but that he is determined objectively to have been a director. Um, and the court must look at the cumulative effect of the activities. So whilst one-off decisions, one-off transactions, excuse me, one-off transactions may well be sufficient to give a finding of de facto director, in reality, it will be looking at the, the whole nature of the, the person's involvement in the corporate structure. The final point that I just want to emphasize is one that was made in the Umbrella Care Limited case, which is the final bullet point. Um, Whilst everything in Smithton and Nager and Keeping Kids Company starts with looking at the corporate governance, and we're all familiar with that starting point for de facto directors, what the Court in Umbrella Care Limited says is that the court will have far less focus on corporate governance traditionally um, if you've got cases of companies being run on a very informal basis. So where you don't have an obvious corporate structure or where you've got family run businesses that are very much round the kitchen table discussions and decisions made on an informal basis without board minutes, without recording decisions in the way that one might expect um, a more um, traditionally run company to be recorded. In those cases, the court can move away from concerning themselves overly with the corporate governance and simply look at what decisions are being made, who they're being made by, and whether that amounts to somebody acting as a de facto director. So those are the cases that I just wanted to flag up. And if nothing else, I hope they'll be useful um, aid memoirs for um, any future claims of similar nature that come across your desks. I just also now want to touch um, relatively briefly on the legislation change during COVID surrounding wrongful trading. Um, I know many of us will be familiar with it. Um, many of us will have remembered at the time the questions that were asked when this was brought in. But... Uh, we're looking at Section 12 of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, which in effect suspended wrongful trading claims against directors for a certain period. 
Uh, it did that by providing that for that period, which was 1st of March 2020 to 30th of September 2020, the court was told to assume that the director was not responsible for any worsening of the financial position of the, of the company. Um, that period, as I say, was initially 1st March to 30th of September 2020. Um, it wasn't extended via the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 in the normal way. Instead, um, Regulation 2 of the uh, brilliantly briefly titled Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act uh, 2020 Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading and Extension of Relevant Period Regulations 2020, which I look forward to having to rehearse in court on a number of occasions. Um, but Regulation 2 of that um, statutory instrument increased the period or excluded the um, period to remove responsibility for any worsening financial position uh, from the 26th of November 2020 to the 30th of June 2021. Um, at the time, a number of commentators made the same point that I make in that bottom bullet point, which is that slightly oddly, that left a hiatus period of the 1st of October 2020 to the 25th of November 2020. Um, it's unlikely, it seems to me, that that's going to make a practical difference in cases, but it may well be that there is a significance to that period. And if cases are brought on uh, that basis for wrongful trading within that specific period, it'll be interesting to see how the court deals with it and distinguishes between precisely when the position of the company worsened and whether it falls into those periods. Um, but it's right to point out that those legislative changes aren't a complete answer to any claims against directors for trading inappropriately. Um, and of course, they're not a complete answer because firstly, there are certain finance sector companies which are not included within that um, restriction on the worsening position. Um, but, it, but actually more um, wide rangingly, it doesn't offer complete protection in respect of companies because companies that were already struggling prior to the 1st of March, 2020, the director is still exposed for the period up until that date. It also doesn't cover fraudulent trading, um, and we've dealt with a case touching on fraudulent trading, but that, that isn't covered by that exemption. It also doesn't provide a defence for any Section 212 type claims brought against the director for causing the company to trade when it ought to have ceased. Now, as for those claims, um, they raise their own interesting questions because for some time now, we've been aware of the possibility of bringing claims against directors for breach of duty, which look very much like wrongful trading claims. Um, and that was something that was probably first highlighted in the 2009 case of Reed e. Games Limited, um, where the um, liquidator brought a claim against the directors for um, essentially ignoring the filing and sending back of VAT returns for about 22 months or so, and failing to pay PAYE and NIC. Um, but the way the claim was put was not that that in itself was a breach of duty, but that it was a breach of duty because it was said that not paying its tax allowed the company to use those monies for stock purchases, which it otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford, which therefore allowed the company to continue trading beyond the point at which ordinarily it would have had to cease and therefore increasing the deficiency to creditors and creating a loss. Um, what was said in that claim with some merit, I think, was that that claim was, um, on the face of it, a backdoor attempt to bring a wrongful trading claim without having to identify the specific date or dates of knowledge as one is required to do in a 214 claim. Um, but that, it does seem to me, opens the opportunity for those sorts of claims to be run if there would have been wrongful trading during the exempt periods, and but for the legislation change, a claim could have been established. Um, but it's right to point out that whilst ED Games has um, gone down in, in history, certainly recent history, as being the um, principal authority on the ability to bring those sorts of claims by way of misfeasance claim, worth bearing in mind that ED Games was a strikeout summary judgment application. And so the burden of proof was a much lower one for the liquidator to overcome, a real prospect, rather than a balance of probabilities argument on um, various matters that arose during that case. Uh, indeed, when refusing strikeout summary judgment, the court did express some doubts as to how likely it was that that sort of claim would succeed ultimately at trial in terms of establishing 
things like causation and loss. Um, there is, interestingly, no reported case applying ED games. Um, so it very much stands on its own and it'll be interesting to see what view a court takes of it in due course if it is um, relied on by office holders to bring these sorts of misfeasance claims. Um, and fourthly, bear in mind, of course, that it seems to me there is at least a very real chance that judges are likely to be sympathetic to directors who are being accused of causing losses to a company by trading during the periods when Parliament had suspended liability for wrongful trading. Um, ultimately, we're all in the hands of judges and the courts, uh, and if they are sympathetic to directors on the basis that it is viewed as a misfeasance claim being brought where a wrongful trading claim could not be brought, um, then the prospects of success must be cast in some doubt, um, given uh, what Parliament appears to have intended in terms of protecting directors from criticism during that period. And um, finally, issues going forward. And there's no um, rhyme or reason to this. It's just matters that occurred to me that might become interesting or relevant in the next months or years that arise partially following COVID, out of COVID, but also generally the way in which directors' duties claims are changing and may change going forward. Um, firstly, claims against directors, where might they end up? What might be the next topic for those? Um, those of you that um, have paid keen attention to the B bills and C bills history will have seen towards the end of last year, beginning of this year, reports within some of the financial press that the government has already started to decline to honour certain guarantees provided within the B bills and C bills scheme. Um, that has been um, done on the face of it because the government takes the view that they were fraudulently obtained loans and therefore is entitled to decline to honour the guarantees, which leaves lenders in an enormously difficult position because whilst they do have the principal debt claim, um, many of those companies who took out those B bills, C bills will be in significant financial distress and may already be in formal insolvency. Uh, and therefore it leaves the lenders with um, almost nowhere to go to recover um, monies which they understood to be backed either wholly or 80%, depending on which scheme they entered into by the government. So um, lenders, it seems to me, may have to consider um, whether they can attack the directors of those companies uh, under the tort of deceit. There may be other avenues to attack the directors, but it does seem to me that the tort of deceit is probably the most likely in circumstances where I suspect the attack that is the most likely against directors is going to be that they um, misrepresented the financial position of their company or misrepresented the purpose for which the loan was being used. Uh, and on that basis, um, essentially encourage the lender to provide the funds under false pretenses. Um, if that is the factual scenario, it does seem to me that the tort of deceit, um, which again is not an enormously popular um, tort uh, at the moment, but it is one that may actually give lenders some relief against directors personally, rather than simply against the companies that took the loans out in the first place. I've set out there a very brief summary of what's required for the tort of deceit. Court needs to be satisfied that the director made a representation that was false, that he knew the representation was false, or that he was reckless as to its truth or falsity, that he intended the representation would induce the lender to act or refrain from acting. The lender was in fact induced, and the lender, the claimant thereby, suffered loss. And subject to whether the factual scenarios can hold water, that does seem to me something that could apply to those sorts of instances where directors have inappropriately taken out C bills or B bills or other types of government backed funding. Um, interestingly, and importantly for the tort of deceit, there is absolutely no requirement for there to be a pre existing legal relationship or to establish a duty of care. So um, that is why it becomes attractive for lenders potentially to investigate these sorts of claims if they think there's um, sufficient merit in it, because they don't have to um, overcome the often difficult hurdles of establishing a duty of care or pre-existing relationship with the director personally, rather than with the director as an agent of the company. The second claim that may or may not take off is just one that interested me in terms of um, its topicality. 
And that's the claim that's currently being intimated by a significant corporate shareholder of Shell, uh, Client Earth. And they have indicated um, as recently as this month that they uh, have the intention to bring claims against Shell's directors for breach of duty, um, which amount to claims that those directors have failed to manage climate risk or failed to properly prepare the company for the transition to net zero in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, Client Earth have been quoted as alleging that Shell's physical assets are heavily exposed to extreme weather events and the wider economic impacts of climate breakdown, something that um, we can assume they will say the directors have not paid sufficient attention to. Uh, and that as far as the net zero transition process is concerned, Shell is facing potentially massive limitations on its operations by that transition to net zero and that the directors haven't taken enough steps to alleviate those issues uh, or to take steps to mitigate the losses that will be suffered. Um, it's obviously proposed that this would be a derivative claim uh, brought by the minority shareholder on behalf of the company in the normal way, um, but it is said to be a claim that's going to rely on the Companies Act provisions in terms of breach of duties. Um, and it's, um, it's not something I confess that I have paid a huge amount of attention to in the years gone by, but it is worth pointing out that section 1721D, when dealing with a company, a director's uh, duty, confirms in express terms that the director has to have regard to the impact of the company's operations on the community and the environment. And it's, it's being said by client earth and other corporate shareholders that are investigating these sorts of claims that that entitles them to bring a claim against directors for failing to have proper regard to the risk of climate change on the business and also the risk of the um, compulsory transition to net zero on the business as well. So an interesting development, um, which sorry, an interesting development, which may or may not give rise to claims which um, directors have to face. And um, one can see that in certainly in the context of Shell and its shareholder, these are not insignificant claims. And, and it may well be the case that if these sorts of claims get off the ground, and there are some, I should say, that have been um, started to be successful in other jurisdictions, certain other European jurisdictions have certainly entertained these sorts of claims and made some interesting preliminary findings in favour of the shareholders. These are things that directors of a number of companies, even not of the size of Shell, will have to bear in mind when carrying out their duties and making sure that they comply with their statutory obligations. Okay, that's, um, that's as much as I wanted to say on those um, matters. Um, I'm just going to quickly flick through the questions that I've had. Uh, an interesting point that's made in terms of um, 212 claims instead of wrongful trading claims, so picking up on the ED Games point, is of course simply not paying HMRC does not ordinarily constitute a breach of duty. Um, and the question that I'm asked here is that is there is there anything likely to come out of 212 claims which are on the along the similar lines to disqualification claims where allegations are not infrequently made of trading to the detriment of HMRC or indeed to the detriment of, of other creditors by paying, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul essentially. Um, I don't think that's going to apply directly because the key point for directors' duties claims um, is, in almost all instances, to establish loss. Um, loss is, as, as was pointed out in ED Games, a necessary element of a, a breach of duty claim against directors on behalf of a company. The one distinction I would make in that is that it, you don't always have to produce evidence of loss. And the cases of GHLM and Maru, which was Mr Justice Newey, um, and Mr. Justice Popwell in one of the uh, Madoff securities cases, um, I forget which one, forgive me, um, did identify that where a director has acted um, essentially in breach of trust by paying out assets to prefer one creditor over the other, for instance, which wouldn't ordinarily create a loss because if you're paying a company's creditors, um, it's removing that, that debt from the balance sheet and therefore not producing an obvious loss. In those instances, courts have said that there may well be a claim against directors for breaching that trust and therefore ordering the directors to repay the sums to the company so that they can be distributed 
according to the Pari Passu principle. So I wouldn't rule it out. I don't think it's ever going to go as far as to simply saying trading to the detriment is likely to give ground to a 212 claim. Um, but those sorts of questions, it does seem to me courts might want to grapple with if there starts to become um, 212 claims bought where wrongful tradings can't be bought. Uh, there is a, a question on the Manalay case about whether there was an issue for the solicitors paying proceeds to a bank account that wasn't a bank account of the seller. Um, the honest answer to that is I don't know because that's a solicitor's conduct rules matter and that's not something I'm um, expert in. But I can tell you that the facts of that case were that the solicitors in question did ask on a number of occasions for confirmation that that account was the account of the selling company and they were provided with emails from both director and wife confirming categorically that that was the appropriate bank account. So it may be that that um, provides them with some sort of um, defence. A uh, question about the Manalay case as well. So husband and wife, if you recall, money's paid to third parties for works undertaken on be the benefit of the spouse. So the question here is, could the spouse be liable where the director has paid monies to a third party, not directly to the spouse, for works undertaken for her benefit? I think the answer to that is possibly. She's obviously not going to be, or he's not going to be responsible for knowing receipt because they won't have received those monies. Um, certainly um, assuming that they don't have some sort of beneficial interest in the ultimate third party. But dishonest assistance stands alone. And so if you can establish all the necessary elements of dishonest assistance, you could claim the losses against spouse as well as director. Um, because that dishonest assistance has caused the loss and therefore you'd be able to bring a claim. Um, again, you need to tick all the boxes of was there assistance and the knowledge of the spouse at the time. But if you can do that, yes, there's no reason in principle why you couldn't recover monies that are paid to third parties rather than to the spouse themselves. Uh, I'm asked in respect of client earth, who would be the beneficiary of the sort of claim that was brought against Shell? It would be the company. So it would be the company and its shareholders, essentially. So it would be a derivative claim bought by client earth as a shareholder, but derivative claims are simply a mechanism for bringing a claim which the company could bring, i.e. a breach of duty claim against its own directors, and therefore the benefit of that claim would go to the company generally, um, and therefore reimburse all of the shareholders, even though it was um, only a minority shareholder or one or two shareholders that brought that claim. Um, oh, the final question. Um, which I'll deal with if I may, is on the on the first case, re-systems buildings. So the case where the director purchased the property from the liquidator at an undervalue. I'm asked a very sensible question, which is, um, was the administrator not also vulnerable to breach of duty as the payments to the creditor were made after their appointment? Um, and you would also argue, I suspect, that the sale of the property, um, the administrator may well be subject, or liquidator as she then was, would also be subject to a breach of duty claim of her own in terms of allowing an asset to be sold at an undervalue. Um, short answer is yes, there, there would be a claim. The practical answer is that the liquidator in this instance, so the office holder here, um, has gained some notoriety in terms of being involved in a number of questionable administrations uh, and indeed was made bankrupt ultimately. Um, and so um, that sort of claim was never going to have any practical value. But in, but in another different instance with a different office holder, absolutely you'd have a breach of duty or a potential breach of duty claim against the office hold. So uh, that all being said, thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I will let you go and I will end this webinar here um, and wish you a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week.